This is Stereoactive Presents. I'm your host, Jeremiah McVeigh, and in this episode, I'm joined by Charles Henshaw to discuss the latest film directed by David Fincher. The Killer stars Michael Fassbender as the meticulous hitman of the film's title. Also in the film are Tilda Swinton, Charles Parnell, Sala Baker, Arliss Howard, and Carrie O'Malley. In just a moment, you'll hear my review of The Killer, followed by my discussion with Chuck. It's almost a cliche to talk about how filmmakers known as auteurs often make movies that are, in some way, seemingly about themselves. But in a year when Christopher Nolan made a film about a man whose groundbreaking work helped change the landscape of the world, arguably for the worse, and Wes Anderson made a film about locking a cast of characters into a tightly controlled environment in order to serve a narrative to the outside world, it's perhaps hard to dispute this sometimes does in fact happen. And now, David Fincher has made a film in which a cold, calculating professional must grapple with the resultant fallout from the failure of his usual perfectionist work ethic. Michael Fassbender stars as the titular character in a performance as precise and intentional as any Fincher has ever directed. And it can hardly be a coincidence that the director chose, as his perhaps avatar, an actor whose work bringing an android to life was the best parts of both 2012's Prometheus and 2017's Alien Covenant. The film is something of a rarity in its dedication to a mostly subjective point of view as we experience the thoughts and actions of Fassbender's unnamed character through matter-of-fact voiceover, as well as sound design and cinematography that often allows us to see and hear the world through his eyes and ears. But for all the access we're given to the killer's interiority, he's still largely inscrutable in many ways. That said, what's compelling about both the character and the film are the small ways in which he reveals himself as human by either accident or momentary surrender to circumstance. Any small moment of humanity presents as a nearly monumental display in the context of the otherwise methodical procedural the film pretends to be, and as a result, those small moments become incredibly satisfying. From this point on, we may discuss elements of the plot that some would consider spoilers. So if you don't want to know anything about the movie, you may want to come back and listen to this at another time. So Chuck, Mm -hmm. what did you think? What were your first thoughts on The Killer? My first thoughts were that I liked that kind of movie. What is that kind of movie to you? Well, I thought it, it kind of reminded me of a lot of different things. It, Mostly reminded me of another movie. Uh, it mostly reminded me of Anton Corbine's The American with mm. George Clooney, um, which I really enjoyed that movie. Another sort of slow burn assassin thing. Um, I never saw that one, actually. It's pretty good. No, yeah. it's, it's better than I than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, and maybe has a little more depth to it than this one. Mm. Um, depth of feeling, at least. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I also realized that I was reminded of the time that we did a podcast about spy movies. Oh, and yeah. it, it reminded me of a spy movie in a way. Um, I never really thought of. I mean, I guess assassins are spies in their own uh, sort of way, and, and certainly assassins play into the spy movie genre. Right. But this really had that quality of deception and, you know, being undercover and having to kind of get through situations without being noticed in the same way right. that, uh, that a spy does. Um, I also, I tried to be uh objective about it because i had heard negative things so i sort of set my expectations low which i think helped um (laughs) that's funny let me let me break it for a second because i had almost the opposite 
experience in the same way, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. I heard lots of good things about it. Mm -hmm. So I tried to set my expectations low just to counter like being um, disappointed by it. Right. You know, sure, having sure. my expectations too high. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that paid off for me. Do you feel like it kind of paid off for you? Yeah, I think it, it I think what I had heard, which was really just like articles and video titles, you know, things like I was disappointed. Why? Uh, Fincher's worst movie. Uh, the one that made me laugh the most was the killer threatens to bore you to death. Oh. Um, but I, I felt like something like that was sort of you know for lack of sounding kind of snooty like a, a sort of unsophisticated take on the movie i think that you have to want to sit for a little while and go with the slow burn kind of concept of it yeah uh, or else i, you I guess i would actually push back a little on on that too just for like i i think there are moments of like explosive right action and kineticism yes. and so to to call the movie boring to me i guess you just it wasn't for you if that's yeah. the case and that's fine you know right. every to each their own nobody not everybody has to like every movie but yeah it's just an odd thing to say about this movie i think because the the brute section of the film especially it's just mm -hmm. like that is a fight that yeah, yeah, with that sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And it was funny because I was thinking that too, where I was like, I wonder if this person like Made didn't get to this part yeah. of the movie or or what. But um, yeah, yeah it's like, did yeah. they just watch the first 20 minutes? Which I did see someone comment on the fact that it has this like kind of very, um, very kinetic to use that word again, mm -hmm. um, opening sequence. And then it's just like, Okay, we're gonna slow down for twenty minutes, you know, mm. or something like that. It's it's like very quick, very quick, and it seems like it's setting you up to like jump into like what you were talking about of like a spy action movie that's gonna mm -hmm. just move. And then right. it's like, no, this guy's sitting in a room just watching a place, and we're with him, and it's kind of I don't want to say plotting because that sounds derogatory, but it, it's right. it's methodical, it's uh, yeah. measured, and then it's like then the inciting incident happens and to me it's like i'm just with him like kind of like what's happening next what's happening right next? that, that right. was my experience of it yeah i would not i would not use the word kinetic to describe the opening sequence personally the uh, title sequence oh that's what they mean yeah, by yeah that's what i mean sequence? it's like oh, it's, okay. it seems like it's setting you up like because it's like this very I see, like i see the the graphics are just like moving and right it's like right, very right, right. exciting looking and then you jump into this movie that's just sort of like it's I like air get gets okay. sucked out you know i thought they meant that the the op the first sort of chapter if you will, oh no 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 like, that, that, that's their point is that it's like right. all of a sudden it like grinds to a halt almost in mm -hmm. comparison of well i did find the the titles were interesting because they did go so quickly mm -hmm. and there was like no at, at least on you know netflix there's like no uh vanity cards or anything so it like really launched you right into just titles yeah, titles titles and boom you know which is very rare um yeah. so I, I didn't think about that that is true yeah it was kind of like oh wow uh but um I think the thing I felt as far as maybe what left me a little cold was I kind of felt like the build up to all the confrontations with the exception of the fight scene were more interesting than the confrontations themselves. Um I think the fight scene uh the interaction he has with the secretary and yeah. that whole kind of will he won't he uh thing um those were really interesting um but i felt that the scene with tilda swinton and is that guy's name charles parnell that's his name uh, right uh yeah i have it here let me just check yeah he charles in... parnell yeah yeah, yeah yeah i guess handler is what we're supposed to think right right um those two scenes I could have done with like a, another draft, if you will. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just sort of felt like, I mean, I liked this idea that 
anytime he visits someone to kill them, they like can't stop talking. I sort of like sure. that kind of thing. This like, that everyone's nervous twitch is to sort of just keep talking so he can't sort of just kill them. <laughs> I didn't um, even think of it like that, but I guess that is true, sort of. Yeah. Uh, but I guess those would have been, you know, it's those would have been interesting moments to. And I think they were attempting to do this about like kind of cracking him open a little bit through um, through the, uh, the through the people. But I just wasn't totally it just didn't totally hit for me. Right. Um, See, the Tilda Swinton scene hit for me later. Like mm -hmm. as I was watching it, I was sort of like, what is happening right now? And then like, right. as I was I, I mean, I wasn't not enjoying it, but I was just sort of like, where is this going? Right. Um, and then as I was thinking about the movie later, I kind of came to the realization, maybe I'm stupid for not getting this in the moment, but just that, um, you know, he's kind of seeing how he could have lived because he lives like hmm. seemingly this kind of tucked away. I don't want to say Spartan lifestyle. It looks like he lives nicely, but he's like secluded. He's like a hermit with his one person he cares about. Right. Um, you know, and, he could have been in the world enjoying culture and food and stuff. And that's kind of what Tilda signifies Tilda Swinton and yeah. uh, her character as like a, a, I guess an assassin um, mm -hmm. of a different kind who, who's chosen to live her life differently. And, and actually, cause that is something that it kind of calls into question of like, what are you doing this for? Right. Like it, it seemingly he would make quite a bit of money for the, this job he does. And he can afford a lavish lifestyle. Like I said, his house is pretty nice, you know, right, and, right. and he, he has means, mm -hmm. um, but what for, I guess he, for him, it's all, it's, he's, he centered it all on this one person, right. Whereas she has centered it more maybe on herself and like enjoying things, um, in a way sure. that he has never done to that extent or in that way. Yeah, you know, and that the the lifestyle doesn't allow him to. I mean, he has to go and like eat McDonald's, right? <laughs> you know, and because that's the way he chooses to do it, right? And sit yeah. in a room yeah. and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. So I could see that. I, I, I felt like I, I definitely picked up on this concept that his method was more than just a method or a technique it was a compulsion um and that was kind of upending what we had spent a lot of the movie hearing him say is he would have you believe that it was like this is how it gets done there's no other way to do it there's no other sort of process that works and this was kind of a way of saying you know what he was doing was compulsive that it wasn't what he right. needed right, to do right, is what right. he wanted to do yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the thing is like he, as you said, he, he, um, we hear him say in his mind over and over, like he has this mantra almost of right. like, this is how I have to do this. This mm -hmm. is the only way to do it, whatever he says. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, I think he's an unreliable narrator. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. He's like, this is, and, and does he only really say that when things are falling apart and he realizes he's like about to go off the path that he he's claiming he should be on? Like, I don't think mm -hmm. we can trust him fully that, you know, so I, I think no, it, I think it adds up, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause he, he says like, Oh, this is new. You know, this is a new experience for him where he has not, where he's missed basically where he has not completed the job and has missed the target. Yeah. And it's such a subtle movie and there's so many things for you to fill in on your own right. that it's hard to sort of determine if it would have been better if the filmmaker, the writer had filled in some of that stuff or had amped it up mm -hmm. or if it, sort of actually works best the way that it is. Um, Cause I was going to suggest that like the fallout doesn't feel that intense. It sort of feels like he's very much in control a lot of the time, even though he is, you know, going after 
his right. own people and 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 um you know on their uh shit list if you will but it never really feels like chaos uh right to me it it always feels like he sort of knows what he's doing yeah, um, I guess my argument would just be that I don't think it would be a David Fincher movie if, <laughs> if it if it was amped up anymore. You know, like yeah, he, I think he is. He he likes to explore the little moments in an otherwise measured existence. Sometimes yeah. <laughs> I think that's right. what this movie is for him. You know? Yeah, and I wonder if that's I I think of it all I. I kind of feel like the most interesting way for me to look at this movie is not so much as a standalone, but as a part of Fincher's. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. filmography. Um, and I mean, it definitely seems like he's, he's commenting on himself with this movie. I had seen somebody say that. And then you said that in your review and I hadn't really thought about how that worked, but I, I get, I get it the way you explained it where, yeah, the killer is so methodical and, a perfectionist and yeah. that sort of and thing. He's willing to wait until the, the everything is just right, which mm. like is something Fincher is known for. Of right. Like he will do endless takes with actors of a, of a scene just because he like, I, I, who was it? I, I was listening to a uh, blank check this podcast that I know I've mentioned several yep. times mm -hmm. uh, in the course of us doing podcasts together. <laughs> yeah. They are currently doing a Fincher mini series because this movie came out like mm -hmm. to kind of coincide with like their last episode will be on the killer and then they'll move on to the next. Mm -hmm. But um, they were talking about in the, their episode on gone girl, which I just listened to, which came out this week as we were recording. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Tyler Perry in interviews said that um, Fincher, when he got to set and he was like, so taken aback by how many takes he does. Cause like, I think Tyler Perry is kind of famous for not doing <laughs> many more than one take. If right. Ever. Right. So, um, not to harp on him or anything. But right. Right. That's the way they work. Two different that, styles. Yeah. And, but he said that like, once he kind of was in it long enough, he realized like, Oh man, he's like an alien who <laughs> can see everything all at once. And so, he notices everything and can tell like, this is not how I want it. And right. so he goes until he gets every little piece of the frame and motion and everything to be as close to what he imagined it or what he thinks it could be. I guess I'm like paraphrasing and like, right. extrapolating from what he yeah. said. But, um, and so to me, it's very easy to see that as a parallel with like, this guy can sit in a room for days on end and just watch a, uh, potential target um, until all conditions are right for him to do his job. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's, yeah. it seems like a pretty clear metaphor, I guess. Right, right. But, yeah, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I had heard that recently too, and I had also forgotten who it was. I um, think it was Tyler. It Perry. was. It was Tyler Perry. Yeah. And um, and yeah, talking about how, you know, he would do takes and then Fincher would be like, oh, this person behind you didn't do X, Y and Z. And right. Kind of made him realize that it wasn't about him, that it wasn't yeah, yeah, about yeah. like she's not solely focused on performance. But then I've also heard that he will sort of exhaust people to the point where he gets them to be a certain. It was very Kubricky and kind of. Yeah, uh, break them down. And yeah, like get them to be their most natural, their like least uh, aff yeah. affected or whatever. Um, but I kind of think, I guess I feel like after, I don't know, maybe the social network was something like after that, he he's he's almost gotten more methodical, like, you know, like he's he's taken it to this real sort of sanitized extreme um even though the films themselves are obviously usually dark and um gritty in some capacity but um i think my favorite movies of his were from that movie and then everything before that and the recent stuff even the stuff that I've enjoyed, like I enjoyed this. Um, I enjoyed Gone Girl. Mank was weird to me. I, I can't remember. We <laughs> did we talk about Mank? We did, right? I, I talked about with that Jackie? with Jackie. Okay. Yeah. And um, I actually just put that episode out for people to listen yeah. to. 
it's it's back out in the world for yeah i couldn't remember if if we talked about it or you talked about it with her. yeah but you you me and jackie talked about fight club yes and i also just put that one out so yes i remember that um and mank was like this sort of outlier movie which i guess had way more to do with the fact that his dad wrote the screenplay than right. any maybe passion he has for like old hollywood or whatever but i suppose he maybe does um but it it's it just seems i don't know like seven and fight club and zodiac there's like there's this emotion behind those movies in a way that I feel is not really in some of the stuff he's been doing lately. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I, I I think it's just that he's to me I would say there's still emotion. It's just he he wants to find the smallest moment, and I would also say that mm -hmm. Gone Girl has plenty of emotion. That movie is like yeah melodramatic in places. It, it is. is. But I don't know if it's hit. I guess kind of what I'm getting at is like there's cynical. Uh, there's a there's a there's a je ne sais quoi about like I like Fincher really was like into this movie. Like he was really on like for whatever reason he was which in, movie? Uh either of the ones that I named. Like he was experiment. Like Fight Club, I think he was super experimental. I think you know, like he was running at this story and pulling out all the stops he could think to pull out as a technician. Um, seven, it's just like, let's see how much we can fuck with people. <laughs> you know, like, let's go dark and let's get weird and do something that's very sort of fresh for the time. Um, right. And then Zodiac, I just feel it's like, let's get let's do a procedural and let's go really hard at it. And we have this great material that really suits his style because it's, I mean, what director would be better to make a cop procedural about a crime that was never solved? You know, like right. just, and <laughs> where the main investigator is a cartoonist. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then Social Network was such a bizarre mashup. It was like, let's take this great writer and this director who's known for making really gritty things and have them make a movie about Facebook. And that was like so strange and interesting. And um, it's not that I didn't don't like Gone Girl or Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Um, I didn't really love Mank uh, or this movie, but there's something about them that says like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. As opposed to, like, having a, a passion for it. Well, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I, I think that there is a part of it that, like, they talk about this definitely in the Blank Check miniseries as they go through his career. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the movie industry has changed. So he has That's to true. sort of, like, and he's and he is the odd... They pointed this out and it was like something I never really thought about. He's the odd like auteur filmmaker that we have today mm -hmm. who doesn't usually get that involved with writing mm -hmm. the material that he directs. So he's sort of reliant in that way on source material and a screenwriter who he's not. That's not to say he doesn't have some authorial um, skin in the game yeah but it, it, it he comes at it as the filmmaker he's right. not like necessarily writing it with the writer like but he's he's definitely working with the writer to get the story to where he wants it to be to before he directs it and then going from there you know but yeah but yeah i, th I think that the industry has changed right and the opportunities for him to make movies that explore some facet of something that he's interested in mm -hmm it's harder for him yeah. to get a movie made. And so Netflix is giving him money right. for <laughs> Mank and the Killer. I think that largely explains those in, and I, in a way. And I should say and, that he does, these are obviously passion. Pro I mean, Mank is obviously a passion project because it's like yeah. a personal thing with his dad writing the screenplay. And I do understand that he's been interested in making this graphic novel into a movie for a while. So yeah, it's, it's not, it's maybe unfair for me to kind of be like, oh, he just sort of was like, oh, that seems interesting. I'll do that. But, no, I, you know. I, 
I, I think I understand what you're saying, though. It, it like maybe another way to frame what you're saying is that it appears to be made someone who is less passionate about it that than, yeah, then he necessarily is less passionate. I guess I feel but, maybe this is the better way to say it. He's he made his bones and did incredible work being like a risk taker. And it's I'm not sure he's doing that as much. And it might be, be yeah. it might be because, as you say, it's harder to get something made that's a risk. Mm -hmm. um, that's totally valid, I, I'm sure. That I, but it also might just be like maybe he's doesn't have as many risks he wants to take now. I don't, you know? it, I don't like, know what risk is there for him now, too. Right. With these right. two movies, Mank and The Killer. Like he's mm -hmm. Netflix is basically like, here's a checkbook, I think. <laughs> right. You, you helped make us what we are. So just right. do your awesome. thing and maybe we'll get some awards. Yeah. Um, but that that said, like I do want to say that like I, I've recently rewatched quite a few of his movies. I rewatched mm -hmm. Benjamin Button, mm -hmm. uh, Girl with Dragon Tattoo, mm -hmm. and Gone Girl. And I've watched Seven somewhat recently as well, too. Mm -hmm. But um, that's kind of outside of what I'm talking about, though. But right. I, I do think Dragon Tattoo and Gone Girl, I enjoyed much more watching them again, especially in the context of watching some of his movies and thinking about them more right. lately. Um, and I do think Gone Girl seems like there's some passion there sure like it seems like it's something he's interested in uh, and i i guess the context of that again something i learned from blank check i feel like i'm just cribbing from them for this <laughs> right. episode is that i guess he made that around the time he was going through a divorce from mm. his uh wife and creative partner right who produced right, all right. The movies up yeah. until then mm -hmm. um don't quote me on the details exactly there but um, so he had something to say about marriage sure <laughs> sure that, sure that i think that that movie gets at in a very like over the top way mm -hmm. that he found interesting. And I will say, like, I think the the girl with the dragon tattoo is interesting because it's like I do think it's hard to say it's not like a cold movie in in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's fun. It's a lot more yeah. fun to watch than I remembered. Like I, I remember it being bleak and grim. And yeah, there is some of that. I'm not saying there's not. Like, there's some pretty like intense moments in that movie yeah in that way but uh it like as a procedural it seems like he it seems like a filmmaker who is enjoying getting away with making that movie right you know what i mean right yeah i i like uh dragon tattoo i think um a couple things to say about movies that are not the one we're talking about uh <laughs> <laughs> are, fair game um i feel like benjamin button dragon tattoo and gone girl they got he got into this mode of like third and fourth acts that where like yeah. it kind of goes on a little bit and sure. um that i wasn't such a big fan of particularly in in benjamin button um yeah but yeah that one that one i'm still sort of like i don't know about that there's some it, cool, it's okay yeah yeah there's some cool stuff in it uh but yeah. it, it, as a whole it's a little uh something and girl the dragon tattoo is like very it's very him doing his thing on a, on a super popular book that has a pretty good swedish version of the movie um and that's a lot of fun to watch him like bring his style to and i also think that rooney mara does maybe a, a better job um than Numi Rapis, who does who does uh the girl in the Swedish version or the Danish yeah, version. I never saw that actually, um, but yeah. Uh but she does, I think, a better job of of communicating her like blossoming love for mm -hmm. Daniel Craig's character. And I do think there's some heart in that where she like really you you legitimately like feel for her in, right. in that way. Um and uh, I think Fincher's a part of that. I think um, I love that he keeps using Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, although I felt like they were kind of underused in the, in the killer. Um, but yeah, I, well, I think it's that what they were doing wasn't like traditional. Right. Music. It almost <laughs> yeah. sounded like sound design. Yeah, I yeah, think. yeah, for sure. You know? um, 
but again it was like i guess it's just hard you know you 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 i hesitate to say it but i wonder if he's peaked and mm. um the social network was such a ballsy the whole thing was balls it was like it was sorkin it was it was the first thing that Trent Reznor and Atticus Russell was like, let's get the guy from Nine Inch Nails to do the music of this movie. You know, like it was all so ballsy and it was like and it was it came at a time where it was like, do we, we're going to have a fucking Facebook movie? Like, who cares? Yeah. You know, and it was just so interesting. And and so. And then seven was so, ball, you know, these were like, again, I kind of going back to what I was saying before about. I felt like he really went out on a limb for a while there. Um, yeah. And I, I wonder if he's not playing it safe. But like you said, maybe there's only so much that he can do yeah. in today's climate. Um, right. Well, I, are, do you think you're going to be watching the killer again? I don't know. I don't have any plans to, but yeah, it's not, it's not something that I would not watch again. <laughs> you know, like it's yeah. not on rotation. It's not yeah. going to be on rotation. Well, I'll say that like once it ended, I didn't think I would be going back to it very quickly, but kind of in the 24 or so hours since I watched it, yeah. I'm sort of interested in going to watch it again, just to kind of like, you know, I've, I've, cause I've thought about it. Like I said, I I'd had some, realizations about some of the movie after the fact that have maybe made me appreciate it more and i'd be mm. curious to see it again and see how they hold up on second viewing right um i would also i i wonder what he's gonna do next yeah because because like a couple things like one the landscape of movies right now is very weird and precarious yep um i i would be i would love to see a big play for a david fincher movie like not a netflix thing mm -hmm. that they put in theaters just because they're sort of obligated to because of who david fincher is like an actual like girl with a dragon tattoo gone girl kind of like commercial play right for for uh that, that is still like very much a, a a david fincher movie right and has all those hallmarks but I'm I'm curious. I I would love to see that or see whatever he's. I'm just curious where he's going. Yeah, next. yeah, and that's why I feel like a, a social network style thing could be a cool thing. I mean, you obviously can't you know reinvent the wheel or do repeat, but I guess I feel like oh, David Fincher's making a movie about an assassin. It's sort of like well, of course he is. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I feel like it would be cool if whatever the next thing was was a little like. Fincher's making that, you know, or whatever that might like the whale, you know, <laughs> like, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> you know, like something sort of it can still well, be gritty and dark. And well, let me well, let me throw this at you. It's not going to happen because of what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know if you've heard that. Speaking of Darren Aronofsky, mm -hmm. he apparently it was just announced he is going to make a biopic of some sort mm -hmm. about Elon Musk. Oh, OK. Which for A24. Right. Um, so all of that together sounds like it could be either very interesting or a pile of steaming shit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Darren Aronofsky to me is like hit or miss. He is. But my hypothetical to you is what if that was announced as a David Fincher movie? Like, would you be like, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for? Maybe. From the guy who did the social network. I really, I wish that I could go back in a time machine and negotiate the deal for him to do the Steve Jobs movie. Um, where it was going to be, it was another Sorkin script. It was going to be Fincher and Christian Bale. And right. they were going to do the Steve Jobs movie. I, nothing against Fassbender or um, Danny, Boyle. Danny Boyle. But I just would have loved to have seen that. So maybe that, it just kind of, Maybe that's the equivalent, you know, of, yeah, or yeah. something like that. Like, yeah, sort of controversial, popular figure of our time, or maybe another time. Uh, yeah, it's kind of thing. 
I, I think I would be more interested in it as a David Fincher movie than I am as a Darren Aronofsky movie. The Elon yeah. Musk thing. Um, Absolutely. I don't have a lot of interest <laughs> in Elon Musk or in seeing a movie about no, Elon Musk. But um, me neither. I mean, unless it's like, I, I mean, there's a world in which I could find that compelling, just as a, almost as like a Nixon movie. Well, you I know, don't really like, know what his... here's a shitty guy. Yeah, and here's what makes him tick. I don't really know. Like, there must be some drama there because the book is supposed to be very compelling. The new, the Walter Isaacson mm-hmm. book. Is it based on yeah, the? That's what Isaac. Yeah, I believe it's based on the Isaacson book. So there's got to be something there. But from what I like on the surface, I'm like, isn't it just sort of like this dude made a lot of money and. In, I don't know, like push the idea of electric cars and space and shit. And like, I don't know, like, where's the drama? You know, where's the stakes? I, don't know. Um, I mean, I think his kids don't love him. So there's there's some drama. OK, cool. Uh, and then Grimes, who's going to play Grimes? Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. like, so I get all that stuff is sort of just not particularly interesting. Me much more prefer to watch Nixon again. Um <laughs> But yeah, I think something in that vein. I think something, epi- you know, like um, Bradley Cooper and Maestro. Now, I don't know how that movie right. is going to be, but yeah, it's, yeah, neither of us has seen that yet, right. I guess, right? But it's very clearly like Bradley Cooper putting all his chips on the table to do this thing of Leonard Bernstein, of all people. Um, mm-hmm. I'd li- I think something like that, something where it would be kind of, you know, where he really pushed and was like, this is my thing. Now, maybe he feels like the killer is that, and maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Um, Yeah. I mean, supposedly, like, he was, like, very into making this. Right. um, There was some, I think, roundtable or something. Not, I don't know if it was a roundtable or a a panel, I think is what I meant to say. Where Andrew Kevin Walker, the writer of the film, mm-hmm. talked about how basically David Fincher came to him and said, like, I want to adapt this and here's how I want it to be. And like, basically, he told him what the script would be. Right. and He wrote it. Um, I mean, I'm sure Andrew Kevin Walker did a great job of adapting it yeah. and all that. But but like he he basically said, like, this is Fincher's thing. Yeah. And this is what he wanted to do. And um I might be conflating a couple of things of like, maybe that was in one thing. And then this panel where they had like the heads of his departments, there talking about the making of the movie. Right. Right. And anytime anyone asked a question, they all said that was David's idea. (laughs) Right. Right. So like he was, I think he, he is very much responsible. Like a lot of people like, you know, like are not into the idea of the auteur theory. Mm hmm. Um, a filmmaking, right, right. But it's hard not to say that if anybody fits that idea, mm-hmm. it's not David Fincher. Well, you know, and you you made me think just now. Maybe that's part of the issue. That I mean, sure, be- it could be because you know he didn't have that freedom on Seven. He didn't have that freedom on Fight Club. He was working very much in tandem with Aaron Sorkin on Social Network. And maybe it is a thing where it's like if it's a hundred percent Fincher as technically interesting and uh you know as much as i never would would dunk on fincher uh maybe it's maybe he's better when it's got that other element of something some sort of yeah could be um for me personally i mean for all you know people like maybe think this is his best work i don't know but uh right i mean I've heard some strong opinions of this movie. People yeah. saying, like, some critics who who are saying it's like the best movie of the year or even of the century so far. And I'm like, I don't know the if I go century. that far. Wow. Yeah, um, I, I thought that was a pretty bold. Yeah, that is lame, but um, um, to each their own. Right, right. You know? And I don't know, you know, I I don't know if I, I if I'm getting old or like there is a little bit of like this guy's not really redeemable. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't want to be like, uh, by which of course you mean Michael Fassbender. Yes. Yes. Michael Fassbender's character. (laughs) Not different. Just to clarify. Um, no, yeah. The killer himself. Uh, you know, he's sort of at the end of the day, he, 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 you know, wins and is on, you know, the beach with his beautiful 
significant other and his beautiful house. And he sort of spent the whole movie just killing people. Uh, and you could argue some of them were in a sort of revenge setting, but like the cab driver guy was sort of right. Yeah, he's also called blood. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I know that, you know, there's plenty of mo- like I love Scarface is not a likable character in that, but yeah, uh, there's just something about it where it, I was kind of like. Well, that maybe was a little too easy for this guy. I don't know. Uh, like he didn't seem to have to change very much. Um, oh, well, I, I mean, sounds like maybe you're talking about Fincher again. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> And um, maybe that's my own—that's my own cross to bear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I—I—I I, I, I thought it was a pretty good movie. Obviously, technically, very, uh, very well made. Oh yeah, and Fun to like watch. I said, the the uh, the story of it, such as it were, has has like kind of stuck with me more than I expected as I was watching it, mm-hmm. as it the credits were rolling yeah, so yeah. um i think that bodes well um for the movie and i i do think like for just listeners if you're somehow listening to this at this point and <laughs> wondering if you should see this movie because you haven't seen it right if, um, i think your, if you're a fan yeah. of Fincher, you should definitely see it like oh yeah you're gonna find a lot in it that's gonna be of interest and I also um, think that he makes yeah. movies you know he i know he loves chinatown and i was thinking about that while i was watching it and yeah, it, it does have the it, it does kind of sit on the shoulders of those 70s, like gritty kind of cynical right. movies that um, are or or like European or something that are are not in high demand at the moment. So if you're a fan of that stuff, it, it would also, I think, sort of scratch an itch. Totally, mm-hmm. totally. Any final thoughts? No, I love David Fincher. I don't want anyone to go away thinking I don't. <laughs> no, I mean, we're here to talk about cool stuff. No, before, yeah, yeah. You know, just have a conversation. Uh, so, no, yeah. I mean, I'm, I mean, that's why I wanted to talk to you about this movie. Right, right. You know, is it like I know that you have an appreciation for David Fincher? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm psyched for whatever he does next. And I hope he keeps doing things. Sometimes I get nervous that he's just like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm done. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm. I want him to keep going. And uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to the next thing. And um, this was cool. It was, you know, yeah, I was down. Yeah. I hope the fact that there was only three years between this and Mank, <laughs> right. um, it, it, even given a pandemic and all that yeah, like, yeah. means that maybe back more to movies than TV. Yeah. Yeah. I love Mindhunter. It could have done in the long run without House of Cards, honestly. But well, I, uh, I, I mean, don't know. Early House of Cards. Like, it. yeah huh early house of cards was was yeah i mean was really cool yeah. and very very fresh um but I, I think both of them kind of ran out of ran out of gas for various reasons um i guess i i i'm not sure i would say that about mine hunter personally but like it just seems like I don't think they're going to do any more. No, right? yeah, so, right, right, right. Yeah, I didn't like the Jonathan Goff character in that show, but well, then yeah, <laughs> I can see how you you'd think about that that <laughs> right. So. But uh, everything else is fine. But yeah, I I'm happy that he's back to doing more movies and less TV, and um, yeah, because I think that's really where the magic is. So totally. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Chuck. No problem. Thank you for listening to Stereoactive Presents, and thank you to our guest, Charles Henshaw. The music in this podcast is composed by Hansdale Sue. My name is Jeremiah Lee McVeigh. If you like what you hear in the show, please rate and review it in Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else that allows that. Doing so helps us to expand our audience, and it's much appreciated. And please follow us wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. Every little bit helps, and like I said, it is truly appreciated. You can also get in touch with us at stereoactivemedia at gmail.com, and you can find more information about this show and everything else that Stereoactive Media is involved with 
at stereoactivemedia.com. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media. 